Hello again, it's Bill DeYoung. It's the Catalyst Sessions, and thanks so much for joining us on this Tuesday. Today, my guest is one of my favorite theater persons in the Tampa Bay area. She is an, an actress, a dancer, a, a singer. She's also an award-winning costumer, and uh, you've seen her in, in a few dozen or more uh, absolutely amazing theater shows, a lot of them at job site and on other stages, too. Most recently, before you know, Big Daddy COVID came down, told everybody to sit down. Uh, Katrina Stevenson was in a Midsummer Night's Dream at job site, which was hard for me to say. That was six months ago, mm -hmm. and and uh, we talked about it a lot in January with with Katrina and other people who were in involved in it, and uh, we're still talking about it because it's still ringing in our ears. And it was the last job site show before. Anyway, so listen, please say hello to Katrina Stevenson. Hello, dear. Hello. Yay. How are you holding up these days? You know, it's, it's, um, it's not one day at a time. It's like one hour at a time. You know, I think it's that, it's that COVID mood swing where one little thing starts to make everything look good and then everything starts to look bad. So, so we're, we're, we're flattening and raising the curve as we go along. Yep. Personal curve. When I spoke to you, well, let's start here. When I spoke with you in, uh, I think it was January, February, I can't remember. They were getting doubt ready and you, I think you had just finished. So it might've been early February. Um, you were teaching at St. Pete College. I think you had, you had three, four, five classes you were teaching. Um, well, okay, a lot. I mean, it was, it was pretty full place. So, I mean, to be honest, I would imagine that kind of fell flat pretty quick with everything that's happened. And where are you now, teaching-wise? <laughs> I started off with the hard questions. They're going to get easier. Uh, teaching-wise, um, yeah, uh, St. Pete College traditionally does not have um, theater courses over the summer. We usually do a big musical, um, which was obviously canceled. Um, and so right now I am doing a lot of teaching for Ariel Dragon Studio. That's yeah. my aerial gym. So I've been teaching, you know, circuit training and bar classes and like silks foundations and beginning silks kind of stuff. So yeah. they'll take me. So I'm there. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to ask you about the aerial stuff in a minute when we get to talking about the stuff at job site, I have some pictures we're gonna look at, including the one from the Tempest with the blue lipstick, which just kills me. Hmm. So, I mean, you're doing, you're doing all right. I mean, you, you pretty much were prepared to not be teaching a lot over the summer anyway, is what you're saying. Yes, yeah. um, and then with everything changing on a day-to-day -day basis with, you know, schools and is it gonna be in person? Is it online? Um, it really looks like a lot of the theater classes are going to be uh, limited to online uh, teaching, yeah. which rules out things like set construction and costume construction and and things like that. So um, it looks like even for the fall semester that, um, you know, my ab ability to teach and to be in the classroom with students is going to be very limited, um, which is kind of disappointing. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, heard from a lot of students and they're like, I can't wait to take your costuming class. And I'm like, eh, you're going to wait a little longer. Um, well, couldn't you all get in a room and wear masks? Isn't it kind of, you know, kind of appropriate? I've, I've said, I'm like, I am prepared to make this a virus free zone. Um, because I'm seriously concerned about, you know, my health and the health of my friends. I don't want to kill my friends. Um, yeah, right. But I mean, like most businesses um, and like most schools, they're just erring on the side of caution and, and, you know, playing it, you know, one day at a time. It's, you know, like booking theater. You can say, hey, we'd like to do this, you know, then. But yeah. when the curve does not flatten and it starts peaking again, then things get canceled left, right, and center. I just feel like this is a, a great test for all of us in some way or another. Like, will you go completely flipping nuts? Will you you know, come out having learned something, you know, or will you, I don't know, too many people who, who said they aren't affected in some way by where this is potentially going. I don't know. Nobody knows nothing. Nobody knows anything. And that's the most maddening part of all. It's, it's maddening and it's frustrating. And as somebody who, I mean, my entire life, I, I do and I teach and, and I watch and I discuss you know, all things, you know, theater and art, um, you know, having to deal with the 
not just a lack of a job, but a lack of identity. Mm. You know, if I can't, if I can't do what I do, um, and what I really, you know, I don't do it because it's fun. I certainly don't do it for the money. Um, I do it because I have to do it. It's, it's what I am. It's what I do. Um, and when I can't do that, then all of a sudden it's like, well, I understand that my job is not essential, but does that mean I am not essential? And, yeah, you know, and you start doing that. There's a lot of angst. There's a lot of existential dread in my that's life. That's that kind of sinister underlying thing about this kind of thing. Like it makes, you know, you're, and I, I go through things like that too. Luckily, doing things like the Catalyst sessions when there are no arts to write about, it helps mm -hmm. me, you know, but I, I'm not defined by my job. And I don't think any of us are, you know, you're a theater person, but you're also a person, you know, and you're a living, breathing human being. And, Listen, I'm giving you therapy here. I know, thank you. <laughs> like you really need. Listen, uh, I went back and reviewed the interview that we did back all those many moons ago, mm -hmm. and, and you said you were from California and Colorado, and I know you went you went to uh, Northern was it Northern Colorado University? University of Northern Colorado. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was close. Okay. I, I like this quote from you, Katrina, which I want to bring up. You said, "I really I like being a performer. I was never comfortable as a human being." but I was really, really comfortable on stage. I mean, does that mean that like from an early age, you're like, yeah, you, you were, you were loud and I'm going, I'm going on stage, mom and dad. Were you um, one of those people? Well, I'm, I'm one of those, I'm an, one of those odd introverted actors. So, you know, Katrina's very quiet and very mm. shy as a very small child, but you put her in a ballet class and all of a sudden she's giving herself solos. Um, she blossomed. You know, <laughs> yes. At home alone, you know, it's like you show me Annie and the next thing you know, Katrina's destroying the coffee table with a pair of tap shoes. Um, I knew the type, yep. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's like, and I enjoy, I enjoy solitude, I really do. Me and Emily Dickinson, we enjoy it. Um, but, you know, you said, you said, you know, you're not defined by your job, well, um, my art is what I have. That is, mm. that is my, that is who I am. Um, and so, yes, I feel truly alive when I'm in the process of creation. When I am mm. on stage, I feel more comfortable than I am just kind of, uh, I don't know, talking on Zoom. And, you know, I just feel like <laughs> an awkward I feel like an awkward bag of meat um, unless I'm on stage. Oh, I love I, I, it's so it's so it's an ugly expression, but I love that an awkward bag of meat. I can relate to that too. You got an MFA from University of Florida. Yes. Uh, from my alma mater, as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, in theater. And wasn't it, didn't you? I think you told me you knew David Jenkins. Then was that like an instant connection to what job site was becoming, or how did you end up down here? Um, he was a third year, so he was in his very last year of graduate school, my first year. Okay. Um, and so we, you know, we ended up, uh, you know, I think the first time I met him was an audition for Tartuffe. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we just kind of, kind of clicked because we were both kind of weirdos, <laughs> weirdos <laughs> in the theater. Um. Wouldn't we have it any other way, man. Yeah, we weirdos were both golf kids and, you know, yeah. the little freaks. Um, and as part of your MFA, you had to do a professional internship yeah, and yeah. he had already moved down to Tampa by the time I got to that point and started this theater company. And I saw their first couple of shows. It was, um, one for the road and Christian love. So, you know, just some really awesome yeah. theater in this tiny little hole in the wall, silver meteor gallery. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I'm like, that's the kind of theater I think I want to do anyway. And if I could do an internship there, that would be more cool than, hi, this is the Hippodrome State Theater. How can I direct your call? Which is, <laughs> which is what a lot of internships end yeah. up being. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I ended up doing, you know, an internship down here um, and stayed because I didn't know where else to go. And wow. then the next thing I know, I'm like, we're doing Dracula and, you know, just, off the wall, the Mineola twins and all of these shows and, you know, that, that idea of, well, I should go somewhere else. I should, you know, go to New York. Isn't that what actors still do? Um, those thoughts became less and less because I was not only, 
being cast and stuff and, and asking to sometimes direct and, and do costumes. But I was on the ground floor and really helping to build, you know, a relationship with community, with, you know, the audience, with other actors. I'm talking with my hands a whole lot. I'm sorry. Um, That's so, you know, and getting to choose the season and, yeah. and going, okay, well, how are we going to, you know, make this a symbiotic relationship? What are we going to teach the audience? What are they going to teach us? What do we, you know, how are we using our strengths and, and, um, you know, just, just fell in with a larger group of misfits, um, you know, a group of, of the, some of the most brilliant artists I, I've ever known um, or even seen. Um, I, I love this. Here's another description. And I think this follows along with what you're saying. Another thing that you said, that you said you usually end up playing the whacked out tart in comedies, usually period comedies, or maybe, do you remember? Evil witchy woman. Mm -hmm. Which made me think, Katrina, that you're Helena Bonham Carter. That, that's what you are. <laughs> I wish. I fell in love with her as an artist during Lady Jane. So she was like, what, 17 wow. years old, 18 years wow. old? Long time ago. Yeah, it was funny. I just did um, the Shakespeare Light series with American Stage, and they mm. asked me to play the courtesan in the Comedy of Airs. Oh, yeah. Which... 20 some years ago, um, I played in undergrad <laughs> and um, somebody asked me, you know, well, you know, is this a lot of fun? I'm like, this is, this is my bread and butter is playing these kind of just, you know, wacky over the top, you know, tarts. Well, uh, how was that, by the way? What's that experience like? I talked to Kristen Clifford a few weeks ago and, uh, you know, I, Comedy of Errors was coming up and I didn't see it. I have to go back and watch it now. But I mean, what was that? Was that next got to be totally weird to have like no other actors, just these little boxes on your screen? Yes. Um, I mean, it was a lot of fun because you, you know, you really get a chance to see what the actors are doing with their faces and, you know, words yeah. and, and stuff. And some of these are actors that I hadn't had the opportunity ever to work with. I think Jim Sorensen was the only one I'd actually, oh, and, um, Robert Spence Gabriel. Oh, um, so it was fun, but oh my goodness. Um, after, you know, acting in a Zoom production and directing a Zoom production, I'm over Zoom productions. Um, the, the great thing about it is it really does put an emphasis on choices and on words um, and, and making a connection, even though there's nobody there. Um, so there, there's a lot to learn from it. And I, I, I enjoyed what I learned as an actor and then watching some student actors work through this. Um, but the most frustrating thing was I just, I wanted to be in the room with these people. You can't make eye contact. There's, there's the, you talked about making a connection. How do, how do you do that? You can't make eye contact with anybody. You can fake it. Yeah, you can fake That's it. That's no good, you know. Yeah, no, and I just, you know, and, and uh, Hamilton for stealing the phrase, but I want to be in the room. I want to be in that room, that good room with those people trying stuff and making stuff, and it's electric and it's alive, and I miss that. Oh, God, yes. I'd, let's, I'd like to look at a couple of, uh, I'm going to share a couple of photos here, uh, various roles from job site. This is Edgar and Emily. I, you said once that this was like one of your favorite things to do. Tell me why. Um, I think because the the actual character of Emily. See, I've even got Emily Dickinson watching over me uh, behind. I noticed me. that I did. <laughs> um, because there's something so light and ephemeral about Emily Dickinson, the human being from, you know, what we know. Yeah. Um, and then the way that the character was written, I just tend to be a little bit more brassy and abrasive. So it was to have to start from the very beginning and create a body and a voice and intentions yeah. that were, were very, very different from myself, but, but her passion, the way that the playwright wrote it was mine. Again, she said, um, my words are all that I have, mm. um, and so, and my my art is all that I have. You, you could create her. Uh, there wasn't so much to go on other than what's known. You, in other words, you can make your own version of her for this piece. Yeah, yeah. Is Paul Potenza um, is that? That's Paul Potenza. Yeah. Oh, 
I didn't yeah, see it, it, this was before I'd moved back here. So yeah, it, talk about a great room uh, to be on stage mano y mano with the great Paul Potenza with David <laughs> Jenkins wrangling the two of us. <laughs> um, it was a dream. It was it was truly uh, kind of yeah, mind changing, life altering. Here we have uh, another one. Look at look at the amazing technology of Bill Dion here. And this is, of course, uh, the maids. Um, yeah. Is that Georgia? That is Georgia Mallory guy. Yep. Oh yeah. Tell, I don't. I, I like. I like the picture. Frankly, but tell me. What, tell, I, tell me about this show. I don't know anything about it either. Oh I don't Lord. Understand what's okay. going on here, but you know. So kind of French existential absurdism. Um, you have two sisters who are uh, domestics. They're maids in France. And um, they work for Madame. That's all you really know. Mm -hmm. And they role play a lot. Uh, they'll take turns playing Madame and beating the hell out of each other and debasing each other. And the two of them, it's because it's, it's not real in terms of, you know, realistic, 100% straight down. They change they play each other. Um, they get confused with who each other is. You're not exactly sure what's real and what's not. Oh, so it's sort of an existential take on the Patty Duke show, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry>. Sure. <laughs> they play yeah. each other, you know. Yeah, and um, I mean, you know, Genet, uh, Jean Genet, he wrote, you know, The Balcony, and he was, you know, friends with Sartre and Beckett and all those people, and that's really all you, Kind of need to know to understand the play if you can ever understand it, but um, <laughs> it was just you know holding on for dear life, the three of us, um, because we didn't know where it was going, and that was a play that just all three of the actresses I, I mean, the other two actresses that I was on stage with I'm like, I would play the silent maid standing in the corner to be uh, you know, on that stage with Georgia Mallory Guy and Roxanne Fay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh Ro uh, Roxanne's a friend of mine, and I think she's fabulous. This is yeah. Orlando, oh. and uh, I, to me, I, what I read, I didn't see this either because I wasn't yeah. here yet. Wow. Fascinating to me, Sarah Rule's adaptation. Tell us about this. Uh, I read, it, I read a synopsis. And, wow, this sounds so cool. It is, it is, it is this beautiful exploration of the human soul. I hate to be just or out there about it. Um, Sarah Rule, who was a brilliant playwright, who her words are poetry. Um, and she dwells in, again, that realm of not quite real. It's real, but then you're like, oh, what? what's going on? Mm. Um, she did an adaptation of Virginia Woolf's great piece, Orlando. And basic plot, Orlando is born in Elizabethan England um, as a boy. Um, becomes a lover to uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the first, uh, then, you know, has a, you know, a Russian no, uh, noblewoman as a lover, then runs away to uh, Constantinople, is, you know, the most sought after man in Constantinople, and then wakes up one morning as a woman. Wow. Um, and then lives, you know, through the Victorian era and into the 20th century as a woman. And it's not that odd to Orlando, and Orlando lives hundreds of years. Um, oh, yeah, that's not odd. <laughs> of course. So it was a piece where you had one actor playing Orlando, and then all of uh, the other actresses in the cast played all of the other characters as kind of a Greek chorus. Mm. Um, and it was directed by Giles Davis, who, oh, that was just. He's, he's been on this show too, yeah, Giles is great. Yeah. Um, and, the thing about that piece, and I didn't realize at the time what it would mean to other people, um, because it's kind of Orlando's journey to figure out Orlando's identity, because Orlando was a successful man and Orlando was a successful woman, but was neither, not really a man, you know, because he had, he, there's these things he wanted to do and wasn't really a woman because, you know, was strong and forceful and all of these things. So it didn't fit into the gender of the outside. And by the end of it, Orlando just realizes that Orlando is Orlando and the exterior doesn't matter. And who you're in love with 
doesn't the, the gender doesn't matter it's those human you know connections um and later on i've had people who saw the show um who've who helped me to understand what a piece like that truly meant to them um because you know virginia wolf was you know nobody really knows exactly what virginia wolf's um you know sexuality was we know that she did probably have a long-term relationship with a woman dressed up as a man to go out into the world um and so there was a lot of just gender ambiguity in in virginia wolf's life um and so now it's one of those things where it's a piece that means more than some of us really meant at the time that's got to um, be a, a fascinating exercise i would think for an actor to to delve into different layers of something like that and say and like or maybe in your 10th 15th rehearsal you go wow i finally understand what this means or, or um, where i'm going you know and i don't know as i ever fully understood what it means um i know what it meant <laughs> I have two dogs. They're very vocal. Okay, well, um, entertain the Is the mailman home? Is that what it is? Oh. Oh. She's mute. Uh, I hope you can't oh, really Um, Yeah, no, uh, I'm not exactly sure I ever understood at the time or even understand now. I could do that play for the rest of my life and probably still be finding things. Because um, things would hit me in performance, like the last weekend of performance. And, and you know, things that I'm like, I never understood all of that before. So. Each show has some element of that though, doesn't it? Like, I can't, I love the idea. It's like, I'm not doing South Pacific and repertory. I'm not. You know, it's, it, it, in other words, there's something new and exciting all the time. When I came back, I'm from St. Pete. When I came back here, the first two shows I saw you in were uh, Cloud Nine. Yeah, okay. And uh, Dancing at Lunasa. Lunasa, yes. <laughs> See, I got it right. And now I want to look at another photo because then things, for my time here, started getting really cool because then we get into the production of The Tempest, which broke, which broke a lot of walls down for me. Um, and this was your first aerial show, was it? Yes. Not? <laughs> Didn't yeah, you, why don't uh, you tell me, David, you said, hey, go learn how to do this, or did you already? Yeah, already no. It was like April. Um, we started rehearsals in December, so it was like in April. He's like, hey, um, do you want to play Ariel in the Tempest? And I was like, uh, yeah. He's like, so I thought it would be really kind of cool if, you know, it was like, you know, in the air. You know, like that Ariel Silks thing that people are doing? <laughs> and I laughed. Uh, yeah. Because um, I knew people that were doing that. And I knew how hard it was. So um, I just... Uh, you know, I said, okay, I'll go take a couple classes, remind you how old I am, and then we'll come up with something different. Um, but I absolutely <laughs> fell in love with it and loved the way that I was able to combine the physical aspect of, of <laughs> Hold on one. Okay, second. I'll keep the folks entertained. Go ahead. Now, while Katrina is disciplining the dogs, I'll sit here and tell you that... Uh, her aerial work in The Tempest and in Midsummer Night's Dream, which we were about to talk about, was exceptionally cool. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Sorry. I was saying all, I... kinds of, all kinds of nasty and terrible things about you. So yeah, no, my you house got made... into it. Like, wow, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because, you know, I was, you know, I used to be a dancer, you know, a long, long time ago. I like connecting word to body and yeah. emotion to movement and, and this is obviously, Ariel is a great way to do that. Um, and I was like in the best shape of my life. So <laughs> I loved it. Okay, well, obviously, you know what's coming next. And it's my last, my last photo of the evening, which will be, of course, a Midsummer Night's Dream, because <laughs> this show, which I said earlier, we're all still kind of talking about, was just yeah. so cool on so many levels. But what you were just talking about, Katrina, in other words, combining that that 
acting thing and, and words and the dialogue on this thing is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Ariel, you know, it was, and I remember you telling me, so I'm gonna paraphrase you again because I can't. I remember you telling me that um, you have to match the physicality to the words and never forget either. Never forget where you are. You could either land on your head or you could do some great spin 20 feet up or whatever it was and screw up the, the words. Tell, yeah. tell me about this show, why, why you liked it. Why, it was, why was it good for you, I guess? Oh, um, first of all, it was, you know, again, I, I love the opportunity to play a character that people don't normally associate with my, either my past or what they think I am. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because they're like, well, Puck's usually cast as a guy or some sort of androgynous thing. And, and well, you're old and, um, you, know, all, you know, fill in the, the blank. But, you got to quit saying that now. I know. Um, <laughs> I'm getting up there in years, though. Right. But to play a character that was not a sexual creature, not, you know, this wacky, you know, utterly feminine thing that was this creature that was you know and i loved playing ugly dirty just you know not caring hmm. you know necessarily about you know my ego just channeling this impish chaotic sprite um but you know i'm a firm believer in just regular acting you know as shakespeare said suit the action to the word and the word to the action that's right um, and so this is just that large scale um every movement for myself and also for the you know the rest of the fairies when we were choreograph choreographing it um i'm like it can't just be pretty stuff say some words i'm like it's got to be connected together so that the audience never loses their investment in it um and using you know movement to kind of amplify shakespeare's words and the mood and the theme and exactly. you know it, it's this fantastical magical thing and we're in this tiny little black box so let's use everything at our disposal and, and that what was you, what, what you did which was very cool if if, if, if i may fawn was mm -hmm. incorporated into so it wasn't so much of the 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 show it wasn't just like oh here's an aerial scene and the fairies go back and forth and this happens and that happens no it was basically it wasn't constant but it was it was worked in threaded into the the you know the tapestry of the of the show which was very cool it wasn't just like a set piece here and a set piece there yeah and um you know it's it's like with musical theater i don't like shows where it's kind of like talk stop sing a song right talk, stop sing a song i like it well, when I mean, it's yeah. integrated in the whole thing and so you're creating this theatrical experience as opposed to a sh you know like i don't know a play you're creating this experience where it's it's a feast for the ears and the eyes and 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 the senses um and if you're going to do something like a midsummer night stream go bigger just go home um, right 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 that's <laughs> go bigger go home well you know i think to, to use that as an example we're just about out of time but i think that to talk about that production which again I keep saying this, but I mean, for me as an audience member, I wish I'd seen it twice because none, it was it was a it was a it was a great cast. Um, you know, Giles is of course amazing. you and everybody, and uh, Cassandra's been on here uh, before playing her music, which is nice. Uh, the direction was great, the lighting was great, but Jeremy Douglas's music, my God! And that let me go back to what I was saying before, though, because it's uh, what you were saying before about how you miss the, the chemistry and the collaboration. That's like all these people pulling together in the same direction uh, to make something that's kind of, okay, everybody knows Midsummer Night's Dream, but you know, this production never existed before the 10 of you or whatever got in a room before. Yeah. And you miss that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, ridiculously talented people, but, but the, but it's that, what is that called? Is it synergy synthesis? The thing where all the pieces just start, because you, we had no idea where that was going to end up. Mm -hmm. um, like I knew Jeremy and I worked with his music, but I'd never helped in the creation process. And, you know, David had watched me do the aerial stuff of the Tempest, but he was never 
involved in, in yeah. putting it together. And so for the three of us, especially before anybody else got in there to just start creating and then to have it turn into that, that, that thing, it worked and it was, it was something greater than the, its component parts. Right. That's magic. That's magic. That's what you can have in the theater that, and it's live and it's immediate and you're in the room, whether you're on the stage or in the audience, that magic happens in that moment and you're all involved. You know, film magic is different. TV magic is very different. Live with, theater, with, when that happens. With a production like that and with so many others you've been in, it, something I've always wondered, I've never asked anybody, is every show somehow slightly different than every other show? Yeah. You know? um, I don't mean, oh, somebody fell or dropped the line, but I mean, just the, the chemistry, just the way it goes. Definitely. Um, you know, there's that chemistry between the performer and the audience. Yeah. You know, if you've got a raucous, drunk crowd one night, and then you've got, you know, high school students, you know, who are falling asleep the next day. I mean, obviously that changes that relationship. Oh, those um, high school students shouldn't be falling asleep. Come on, kids. Yeah, I know. You learn something um, here and you'll have a good time too. It happens. Um, <laughs> but also where you are, as a human on a given day, mm. um, you know, it shouldn't, you know, it's not a 180 change, but you know, we're people and, and we're, you know, creating and channeling stuff. And so that changes the, and then you watch as it grow or as an actor, you know, when you have those realizations, those discoveries that you realize something for the first time ever on stage in performance with an audience, it can, you know, it can totally move things in a different direction or, yeah just heighten. I mean, I've had a, you know, a couple of times like on stage where something hit me and I turn into a snot bubbling, sobbing wreck that completely kind of, you know, makes things very different that day. This um, might have been some of my favorite performances of yours, the snot bubbling wrecks. <laughs> I'm an ugly crier and I've owned that. <laughs> yeah, it is, well, you know, it is beautiful to see you again and uh, we are out of time but I can't say thank you too many times, Katrina Stevenson. We'll be seeing you on the other side of everything. Yes. And uh, checking in with you again, I hope soon. All please right. Take, please take care. I shall, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks.